Um, so I believe I have, is it an hour? Okay. Um, feel free to leave beforehand if it's not compelling. So today's talk is about health freedom, but I'm going to focus on food as medicine because it is the most radical concept that has ever existed within the conversation about healing and medicine. And it's so familiar to us now that it's sort of trite and, you know, it's sort of like a bumper sticker, but I want to give you a new view of the meaning of this term. And actually, I want to take us beyond the meme altogether of food as medicine, because it still does speak to the allopathic model of there being something to medicate, maybe symptoms to suppress naturally. And really, that's not what we're talking about. Um, just a little bit about me. I should have put parent first, because most of you who have children know that's the most illustrious title that you can have. Um, so I found Agreement Info uh, in 2008. Oh, thanks. <laughs> oh, thank you. That means a lot to me. I mean, really, the site now is sort of like a news site, but behind it is a lot of the research that I was able to gather over the years in front of my computer, very unhealthy uh, obsession. I lost some of my eyesight in the process, and I, it's remarkable that I don't have like a tumor sprouting at the back of my head. Uh, <laughs> but at the time, you know, I was looking for things like how to attenuate LCD radiation and, you know, prevent cataract formation. Uh, incidentally, lutein and, uh, what is it, uh, B-propolis is very effective at helping to prevent electromagnetic radiation damage. So anyway, that's been my main passion and credential, but I'm an activist as well. So I was very fortunate to be asked to be part of the global non-GMO coalition with people that I've looked up to for years, like Vandana Shiva. Um, and uh, there, there's a really great movement out there, people coming together who stand for the same thing, which is, you know, we want to be able to eat food that is healthy. And there are a lot of forces at play that are against that concept. Uh, I was just been elected to the Board of Governors for the National Health Federation, which is a great honor because they are the ones that go to the codex around the world. They have these monthly meetings uh, through the World Trade Organization, which we're a member nation, believe it or not, so our constitution doesn't protect us against, for example, being forced to have GMO food or irradiate our food for it to be traded between nations. So they use that as leverage. So the 170 plus member nations of the World Trade Organization, get, they sit down and discuss you know, why vitamins are toxic and you shouldn't have more than 50 milligrams a day, or why, you know, glyphosate is really good for you and you should have high upper limits of tolerance in food. So this foundation, which is highly un underfunded and is uh, tirelessly dedicated to health freedom, is out there doing this on a global level uh, all the time for us. So I do what I can to support them. It's not nearly enough. And then, uh, an editor reviewer for the International Journal of Human Nutrition and Functional Medicine, uh, another great honor because, uh, you know, for me, functional medicine is just sort of a, a cla you know, sort of a new brand of naturopathic, you know, sort of health. And so it's, it's good, you know, they have a Cleveland Clinic uh, project now, so they're integrating into the mainstream. Some might say that's not necessarily a good thing, and I'm also a little bit cautious about meaning of that, but uh, regardless, um, and then Fearless Parent, amazing parent-centered organization, if you don't know about them. It's all parents who, you know, acknowledge our freedom to choose what to put in our bodies, our children's bodies, and what shouldn't be, you know, forced into their bodies, like vaccines. And a co-founder of the Vaccine uh, Alliance uh, to, to generate awareness of, you know, not anti-vaxxer awareness, but rather the millions of injuries that have occurred. And, and we want people to know there's science that shows clearly uh, that that's the case and that the manufacturers of vaccines can't be sued for creating a product that can kill you because uh, they've been indemnified. Um, people just don't, unfortunately, know enough about this. So I got a lot of advocacies, obviously, but the one that today we'll talk about is food as medicine. I love this quote. In fact, Mark Tomasi lent me a book years ago, which I haven't returned to him, by Arnold Eret, uh, who is the raw food advocate who quoted a Greek scholar, so he kind of copied him, uh, which is, we dig our graves with our teeth. And so that's an important term because when you really think about it, you can't control what you see, what you breathe in. The one thing you can, in theory, control is what you put in your mouth. It's a very powerful fact. And there, there's this 
massive nexus of forces from globalization to you know, religious uh, uh, issues, political, you know, as far as what you can put in your mouth. So hopefully, although I'll be describing some very dark forces at play, uh, we can all feel liberated by the end, knowing that we can truly take back control of our health with our food choices. Um, and of course, you can't just sit back and watch the entire world be swallowed by the GM agricultural model because it's basically destroying uh, biodiversity from the microbes in the soil all the way up. Uh, that's the model. You just spray chemicals that were used in the war theater, like you know, 2,4-D was part of Agent Orange, and you kill every living thing that exists except for the plant that you have your little barcode genetically encoded in it that can survive the poisoning, even though you're going to eat something that was sprayed with chemicals that are deadly and then there's nothing else standing. That's literally the system that is crystallizing all around us. So you can't really sit by. You have to be an activist, because you, otherwise your progeny, at least, aren't going to stand a chance. <clears throat> so this beautiful image is of the body healing itself. And you know, unfortunately, uh, we forget that even in the cases of cancer, you know, this big, terrible image of this juggernaut that is you know, gene-based and is just going to go off in our body like a time bomb, even cancer heals itself if you remove the interference. So this is really a main theme that I like to talk about, which is reawakening the inner physician and acknowledging that technically the miracle being performed on a moment-to-moment -moment basis has nothing to do with your allopath or you know, really even naturopath. If they're a good one, they won't even take credit. I remember Dean, who's here from Herbs of Light, his master herbalist, used to tell us, you know, when we were in the retail space that he, he's trying to uncreate customers because he just really wants to get them back in a balance. And, you know, that's not really the best business model, but spiritually it's just such a profound statement, and it's true. And a lot of people that do this kind of medicine or advocacy, they see their patients come in, they're really sick, and they walk off, and they're healed, and they struggle to pay their bills because you can't really erect a successful business model on this, on the truth. Um, so, of course, even in the field of nutrition, the nutraceutical sort of meme has taken over, and we're kind of still using a model that's based on this machine-like body that falls apart because of entropy, and you have to find ways to modulate it here and there with nutrients. And, you know, I think that it's important that we get beyond even looking at, you know, natural healing in this regard, because it's been co-opted by the same basic paradigm. Um, it's fascinating, too, because I think, in my experience, and there's some clinicians here or people that work with the public with health issues, there is something Eucharistic about giving someone something, and the thought that taking a pill, you know, be it natural or chemical, is somehow going to heal you, it's that act, you know, and the, it's the it's a ritual of medicine that is so powerful. And we know about placebo, which is, you know, if you have a good attitude and you really think someone's going to heal and you really care, that's what's really giving your body permission to heal itself. And somehow we're now enculturated to not have that happen. And on the other hand, if the doctor looks at your report and says, well, gosh, I think you're not going to make it in six months, it's very likely that won't happen. So there's so much responsibility. And, and that's true for anybody. You don't have to be a doctor or patient. It's like our relationships, the way we talk to one another, a lot of power there, and I think you'll find the science is now confirming that this is the case. Um, so we want to go to the root cause. We want to re resolve it of all of our ailments. And again, food is going to be a huge part of this. So I find today's technological access to information to be so profound because we have a global brain right now, right? Photons literally carrying information around. Anyone with a device, there's billions of them, can access literally millions of years of information that's accumulated. Now, when it comes to the convolution of the global brain associated with science and medicine, there's this amazing treasure house. Those who follow Green Med Info know that's what we're based on, is just make people aware that this resource exists. You've paid billions of dollars of taxpayer money to have it funded. And it's the Google of medicine. So you just plop in a word like turmeric, and you'll find 7,000 peer-reviewed studies that emerge over the past 50 years. Um, so this is something that also is very empowering, because when we start looking at food as medicine, uh, you start to realize that there are literally millions of studies that now support uh, this notion. 
and hopefully will move us forward where drugs are no longer even looked at as a sane approach to, you know, treating a body that's usually already poisoned by chemicals. Because uh, what, what are pharmaceuticals? But they're patented chemicals. And they're xenobiotic, meaning the body has no prehistory of ever uh, being exposed to it before, barely knows what to do with it. And there's hundreds of thousands of them now, of course, in our food. So you can see there's been an explosion of data. If you type in the word nutrient into PubMed, 23 million citations available to you. And this is what I do for fun. It's like going to the Gulf and fishing. I'll just sit there and think of a keyword, throw it in there, and every once in a while, you'll get these clinical pearls that are so devastatingly awesome. And that's what GreenMed has 23,000 of them that I've uh, indexed. And each one of them, to me, is like this you know, glistening pearl that could revolutionize medicine. But there's been, since 1982, there were 7,900 results. Now, in 2013, there's 55,000. And any topic you look at in this field, you're going to see this exponential increase of data on, you know, validating it as, you know, relevant to medicine. Uh, so, again, that's a little promo for what we do. We try to vindicate the ancient traditions and show that, yes, the research is now substantiating what your grandmother and whatever cultural healing traditions passed down has been saying for generations. So... Here's a big problem, though, is that the field of nutrition has been sort of uh, co-opted by this reductionism. Of course, you know, uh, scientism, for example, is the view that there's only one way of obtaining the truth, and that if you, you know, don't abide by that standard or viewpoint, then you're crazy, irrational. You maybe should be jailed, right? Um, that's a sort of medical monotheism, and it's a religious fervor that underpins it. It has nothing to do with evidence. Certainly nothing to do with common sense. Um, so we're in the field of nutrition. There's been a lot of misinformation. Look at this amazing fractal cauliflower. It scares me. There's got to be all kinds of anti-nutrients and toxins in there that we're not supposed to eat it, I'm sure. But I have eaten it before. But that is beautiful, and it represents the infinite complexity of food, which can never be reproduced, certainly never analyzed with any kind of efficiency. So when you look at the nutrition facts, of course, we're still ca counting calories. We're looking at the amount of building blocks, the carbs, the proteins, the lipids, the vitamins, the minerals. And, you know, we think that that's telling us something about nutrition. And it really isn't. So really, if you look at the word information, it means to put form into. And when I look back at this cauliflower, there's infinite information in that. And I can actually explain a little later that that's a true statement. It's not just a, a metaphor. Um, and this is how our genes work, and this is how our bodies work, is we've gone through this decade, for a decade now, okay, after the first draft of the H Human Genome Project uh, came to completion, we entered a post-genomic reality. And many don't know this. Uh, my colleague, Jonathan Latham, from Independent Science News, he uh, revealed that the tobacco industry was behind uh, the funding of the Human Genome Project. Because what a great way to distract from the obvious fact that, you know, your product is producing cancer, an environmental cause. Well, let's just look for the answer to all disease, the holy grail in the human genome, the three billion base pairs that make up, you know, the uh, genome in our cells. And so the idea is that we entered this new realm where we realized there's only 23,000 protein coding genes, but yet there's over 100,000 proteins in the human body. I mean, they were expecting to find at least enough in the blueprint to explain the existence of our form. And, I mean, 23,000 is nothing. So we entered a whole new world historical place, which still, if you go look at the mainstream news aggregators like Google, every then there's articles on how a new gene that's uh, connected with liberalism emerged. I mean, they're, they're still doing, like, this is medieval, the, the level of non-intelligence out there. But when it comes to... <laughs> I, that's insulting the medieval ages. Sorry, they, they had probably a lot better sense than we do. But, um, anyway, so food puts information into our body. It is composed of information, is what I'm trying to say in a fancy way. Um, and so now the focus is on what's beyond the control of the genes or above it, epigenetics, which includes everything, you know, that we can choose to expose ourselves to, including even thoughts, because the mind-body 
cascade of events from top down gear into real physiological processes that have been you know, molecularly validated. Like, for example, fight or flight. Your doctor says you, you have cancer. It doesn't tell you that you have ductal carcinoma in situ, which had no symptoms when you got your mammogram. It's not even cancer. In fact, it's a benign growth of epithelial origin, according to a new National Cancer Institute uh, funded panel. In other words, you think you have cancer. You don't. It's benign, like millions of women were told. And then you get this adrenaline response, because the nocebo effect, the adrenaline activates g glycoprotein in your cells, which is basically what causes multi-drug resistance. So you can actually feed the cancer on a molecular level based on just the response to inaccurate information. So mind-body medicine and just this whole cascade, I mean, it's just, it's clearly hyper-relevant when, you, when you're looking at this new uh, view of the body and nutrition, epigenetics. Okay, so, and there's also a field of nutrigenomics and nutritional genetics that look at nutrient gene interactions. So there's like these very uh, interesting new disciplines that have emerged because they're acknowledging that food isn't just, again, building blocks for the body and a source of energy or fuel, like you put gas inside of your fuel tank. Rather, it's a source of information. And we know now through studies on things like uh, SNPs or mu mutations within your genome that you can be more susceptible to certain types of diseases uh, if you have them. But you, we also now just know even having methyl donors like folate in adequate quantities can neutralize the adverse effects of those, uh, quote, variations. So, you know, this is actually not really that new after the, you know, uh, the post-genomic revolution, there's been a lot of interest in this. So, just to give you a sense for how much information and intelligence is embodied in something as simple as an apple, I wish I'd brought one, is that there's something called Leventhal's paradox, which is if you look at the primary sequence of a protein, the amino acids linked together in this long chain, that's the primary structure. And, you know, in classical molecular biology, um, it was considered that information only resides within the primary structure, and that it's the, obviously, nucleic acids in your genome, the DNA, that carries all the information that makes all of this possible, this body, right? Really bad, you know, idea, and it's been disproven. So, in order for a protein, and, you know, apples do contain protein, to fold into its natural state, known as its native conformation, it has to go through so many degrees of freedom that there's not enough time in the universe so far to even allow it to go through all of those uh, different folded states to the right one that it conforms to. Um, and that's called Leventhal's uh, paradox, is that you can't explain this um, folding from primary, secondary, uh, tertiary, quaternary structure uh, based on the information certainly within the primary sequence of amino acids. You know, so the same applies to the DNA generally, is there's still this really ridiculous view that, oh, if we find out what's in your genes, we can explain something about your health. Like, we can't even explain how protein folds. It, it's a mystery, but it does, and it's such a specific way. There's only one properly folded confirmation for a protein in its natural state. Now consider that if that design, that blueprint, that intelligence is there so that our bodies can be whole and healthy, if you start genetically modifying things or radiating them with gamma radiation and destroying the molecular bonds, like what do you think you do to the information? It is a miracle that you and I are even here standing looking somewhat healthy given what we have been exposed to for generations now. Um, and that's a really a profound fact. It speaks again to how all healing is truly self-healing and, and why we have to also consider that, that what's going on in the planet, especially later with Jeffrey Smith's talk, and hopefully uh, David Perlmutter will also come up, because it was, they had the most fascinating discussion yesterday about the connection between glyphosate and you know, the bacteria and how that causes all kinds of disease. What we're doing right now is the worst possible human experiment uh, when it comes to, if you just look as simple as creating a conventional apple, but this is a, a food and thought one, right? There's a bite in it too, wow. Okay. So it's not a poison apple then. Um, let's see. Yeah, and I was just putting this image here to show you faux food. You know, it's just chemical excreta processed like wheat dough with 
sugar from a GMO corn plant and all kinds of preservatives. Can you imagine the difference in information between that and this? And how is it going to instruct and properly educate our genome to express itself correctly, given the infinite complexity of foods that we co-developed with for many, many generations? I won't say billions of years, because there are probably some creationists out there, but going back to the, uh, you know, Eden, same, same metaphor. So the central dogma has been completely overturned, which was, of course, the information flow goes from your DNA to your RNA to proteins, and they really don't go back. And this is actually something that even the, you know, person who came up with this, um, uh, Craig, he, he, he even said it's possible that, that there is two-way information flow. So even he accepted that this was never truly, you know, his, his ultimate opinion. It was just a hypothesis. So now we know, based on prion diseases, okay, so you know about Alzheimer's, there's misfolded proteins, and they conform to different types of arrangements. Um, like a beta sheet is formed, there's a different geometric arrangement, and that causes the information to be passed laterally to other healthy proteins in the brain. It's just this terrible effect of everything misfolding. But it's, it's, it's information, that information that's being laterally communicated. So there's no infectious agent, there's no virus, which is, you know, viruses are pieces of genetic information looking for chromosomes, basically. There's no, so in other words, information can be passed through confirmation. So when we start understanding that, then when we eat an apple with all of these complex lipids and proteins and fats folded in a specific way, that's actually kind of moving through us like a wave of information, and it's helping our cells to attain their proper native confirmation. Um, there are a lot of examples now where this whole concept of the unidirectional flow of information from the DNA out is completely overturned. Retroviruses are a good example. They have reverse transcriptase, and they encode information directly into our DNA, going the other direction. Um, HIV is an example of that, and it can change forever our genome. Let's see. So we talked about the epigenetic revolution. Same thing, there's so much burgeoning research on this topic now, and the implications, of course, are very profound, that we can alter <laughs> in real time the offspring that we have, for example, new research came out last year showing that the sperm can respond to um, the behaviors in the cells through information transfer. These little nanoparticles called exosomes can carry things like microRNA and can go encode into the sperm. So if you're a carpenter and you have a certain set of proteins doing a certain type of behavior, that information could actually get transferred to the sperm so that your child is able to express these traits. And that's, so that's the Lamarckian view, which Darwin in theory on evolution kind of canceled, you know, which is the idea that you can't pass down those traits directly. So this is changing a lot. This means if you're a mother and you give birth to a child and, and, and you're forced to take intrapartum antibiotics at that moment, you know, they, they, you can't implant that next generation of healthy bacteria into your child. Those sorts of effects could, could you know, absolutely affect the, all generations of the future going down that germline. Um, so we're in a totally different era. Okay. What is that? So anyway, this is just the whole notion that, you know, it's like we're at this point in nutrition and actually just generally almost every topic where the, you know, sort of the, the term science comes up where we think that the finger pointing at the moon it is the moon itself. So we've now thought that like the nutrition data on a package tells you something about what this food is and what it's going to do to your body. It's not true. It's complete myopia. You know, we need to start really understanding the difference between quality and what we can quantify. Even the color itself can absorb into your, 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 your perception and affect you on a very deep molecular level. So there's so much about the sensuality of food, how it was prepared, who you're sharing it with, that is going to affect its, quote, nutritional content. In fact, there's the vitamin P concept of pleasure itself having such a profoundly beneficial effect on, our, on your body. And that's far beyond what science can tell us. So, so food is sacred. And when you really look at the etymology itself, it's fascinating. You know, all these modern languages boil back down to the Indo-European proto-language that no one knows has an example of it existing, but it was the, the mother tongue. It's like this tree. And the word health literally connects to three words. It's 
uh, whole, holy, sacred, and to heal. So, you know, that's where you get things like the Eucharist, you know, this is true, is that, you know, there's something about uh, nutrition that can bring us right back to that awareness that there isn't this differentiation. This isn't just food, you know, a bunch of atoms. Um, this is connected deeply and should be to spirituality, and it can help make us whole, uh, assuming we get the right kind of food. I think that this was happening as the science is kind of now leading us to that point where it's almost like a religious experience. I mean, I think about the protein folding mystery, and it's just kind of amazing, you know, to think that this exists and that it can, it embodies so much complexity and information. And yet it's a single thing that I could eat. Um, even the word nutrition comes from the root nourish to suckle. And when you think about that original act, okay, you're born and there's no separation between the deepest intimacy uh, that a human can experience and the moment of nourishing. And when you think about this, what I've always thought is, if you think about the placebo effect, oftentimes lactose was used as a placebo. And can you imagine the epigenetic imprinting of the birth moment where the first experience of being born into a crazy world in theory, uh, if it was a natural birth with you know, water, maybe it wasn't that way, but then you get this experience of the breast, the nourishment, the mother, and lactose. So could that be why the placebo effect is so powerful in certain instances? Because you're getting a sugar pill. It's not poisoning you, because with the actual treatment group, they give you a poison in the pharmaceutical model. So no wonder they have to control for the placebo for there to even be the sort of political construct of evidence-based medicine. Because it's a very presumptuous term, the evidence of my experience is more compelling, you know, the N of 1, any kind of randomized, double-blind, multi-center, placebo-controlled trial from Cleveland Clinic, you know, which is just owned by Big Pharma on some level. Okay, some people are not going to like what I just said. Um, but I think it's true. So, so, so this is something to think about, is when we, we think about nutrition, uh, it does really tie back to these basic human experiences that are very sacred. Yeah, that's potentially one of Monsanto, uh, their future plants, the last one standing, as everything on the planet has been destroyed by their chemical model. Uh, kind of a depressing image. Okay, so. so the food quality issues help us to understand one thing, is you can't just go shop at, hopefully you're not doing this anyway too much, Whole Foods, and think that you're just buying your organic food and you're going to protect yourself from what's going on, like this sort of this luxuriating concept that we can hermetically seal ourselves off from what's occurring outside. Because at this point in time, there is no going back when it comes to biopollution. Jeffrey can talk deeply on this, of course, but once the, it's almost a form of rape. Uh, in fact, Vandana Shiva used that term uh, in terms of uh, what happens when a GMO plant like actually sends off pollen and then infects a non-GMO neighboring uh, plot with these genetically modified uh, proteins. Obviously, you can't be undone, and there will be no organic in the future because of that. That's the vision that is inevitable. I do believe there's a way, maybe, that we could somehow undo it with technology that hasn't even been envisioned before. You know, I'm a fan of Tesla. If you look into his work, you'll realize, like, almost anything is possible. Even Paul Stammen with, my, my, you know, using mushrooms to degrade, you know, the uh, BP oil spill uh, within like three weeks producing, in theory, an edible mushroom is just amazing. But what we're seeing now is the, the death of our planet. I mean, that's definitely not sensationalistic talk. It's just the reality of what is actually happening in this model and how it infects every single uh, neighboring non-GMO or organic plot. You just, you can't undo it. So it should never have been approved for that reason. And that's why we shouldn't be talking about labeling I mean, yes, there's some legitimacy to that, but you've seen many defeats, and, you know, it's really about banning, you know, GMOs, and especially when you understand what glyphosate is and how it contaminates every single plant that it's used in, you realize that we're all being poisoned, and we're smiling about it and not doing anything about it, but it's really scary. So, this is just a map of the proteome of a particular seed, actually. I think that is oats. But it's just showing you just a visualization of just how complex things are. But what I wanted to point out is that food has meaningful information, okay? It's intelligent. 
It's not just overwhelming, because sometimes the way I talk about it, I even get confused and overwhelmed. And you see certain poetry in nature, you know, the law of uh, signatures right here. Isn't that fascinating? The walnut and the cranium, and the two hemispheres, and they're you know, omega-3 fatty acid rich, which is very good for the brain, of course, and there's also neuroprotective compounds they've identified now that prevent amyloid plaque formation. But look at the flowering plant, the pomegranate. It's the ovary of the pomegranate bush, and it literally looks like an ovary, and it can replace the ovary. In the very wicked vivosection-based model of experimental science, they use ovarectomy, they pull out the ovaries of the animal, and they induce, you know, a, a fast-paced osteoporosis, depression, all the things that come with perimenopause, menopause. They give one group pomegranate, and it's as if they never took out the ovaries. And it actually has estrone. It's the largest concentration of bioidentical estrone in a plant discovered. So is that just a coincidence? That's like, that's God, nature, that's poetry, and it's just right there in our face. But of course, we're not going to understand it using present models of science and nutrition, I think, again, we have to acknowledge the intelligence. And I'll go further, and when I show you turmeric, you'll understand what I'm saying. Compassion embedded in nature. So a really famous study came out in Chinese subjects where they fed them. Um, it was rice, and they found that these little non-coding RNAs, micro-RNAs within foods, can go into the subject's bodies, be absorbed into their blood, and start modulating the genes, specifically liver genes related to the LDL receptor. So we now see, too, how clearly, again, the information is passed horizontally from what we eat. And there's no drug that can do this without disrupting hundreds of different pathways. This is food that is able to do this. And it won't ever be produced, I, I believe, either with you know, fancy nutraceuticals. Uh, this was a very powerful uh, article that came out last year. And this was the one where the nanoparticles, these little um, 10 to 100 nanometer wide uh, spherical particles, are present within all cells. So you're eating an apple, and it contains these little uh, spheres. And they contain these RNAs and different building blocks that have information, proteins, and lipids. And they're capable of going into the body. They looked at ginger, they looked at grape, grapefruit, those are the main ones, and downregulate all of these pathways that are related to inflammation. Um, so uh, they're called exosomes. So again, such a powerful new field of research is opening up, showing us the very mechanism by which foods, well, we are food, you know, we, we know that, but how they completely are able to do what no drug can do. This is my favorite one. I spent four or five months just trying to index curcumin turmeric research. And at that time, there were only about 4,500 articles. This was like 2009. Now there's about 7,200. And this helps people to understand what I mean by intelligence and compassion within food, is that this is a retinoblastoma cell, a type of pretty much neurological cancer. And what they did is they administered some curcumin within this like living cell petri dish. What they found was it was able to downregulate 903 genes, its expression, and then upregulate 1,319. So it's a profound fact that something as simple as just curcumin has that much intelligence that it's able to select in a meaningful way vast amounts of potential genes and then just it, like this compassionate hand doing magic, able to. So what happened is that that cell was able to regress and, and, and no longer be cancer. So it was able to do the, you know, impossible according to the conventional view of what cancer is. Um, and so, let me see, do I have this image? Yes. So this is what came to mind. It was almost like this Hindu goddess with the many hands. Because over the years, after doing this elaborate indexing project, I found over 100 and 170 now different pharmacological pathways, I call them, you could call them physiological actions, that curcumin has been shown to articulate. So intelligent ways. So like if you have polymyalgia rheumatica, some you know, new syndrome actually related to statin-induced poisoning, interleukin-6 is upregulated. It's an inflammatory you know, compound. And so curcumin, we've indexed like about 10, 15 studies on it, downregulating interleukin-6. So you know, there's very specific ways that it does its magic. 
But in some cases, it's going to do the opposite. It might downregulate a, a certain type of hypertension, and you know, if you have low blood pressure, upregulate it. That adaptogenic, intelligent qual quality. So it was known in Sanskrit as the yellow one. It was the one whose face is light and shining. It was known as a golden goddess of compassion. And so we're coming back to ancient wisdom in a new way because what the research, when you really look at it, is saying is that this is basically an intelligent being that is capable of fixing things that really shouldn't even be fixable and can do it down on a molecular level. And that's because, again, food has massive amounts of information as well as intelligence and, again, compassion. This is the one plant that... According to my indexing, over 630 diseases it's been shown to mitigate, prevent, or undo uh, based on a lot of it's not clinical because you're never going to see someone fund a trial on a non-patented substance like this. But, you know, it's very compelling. Especially when you're using it even as a spice in your food, you start realizing, like, this is, like, health insurance. This is, this is, this is doing amazing things. And there's a larger notion in this field of, xenohormesis, that these compounds, curcumin and turmeric, catechin and green tea, resveratrol and peanuts and grapes, represent how, say if a plant is stressed, there's organically form, uh, farmed one, it's gotten scars, bugs are trying to eat it, and survives, fluctuating weather conditions, it produces these compounds that send signals to those who eat it that they need to upregulate longevity genes, maybe downregulate those that store fat, and so this is the notion that we co-evolved or developed with certain plants such that we need them to be healthy and that we need them to be grown in a certain way because stressed out plants produce these polyphenols and xenohormetic compounds, not conventional farmed ones. We're using petrochemical fuel, uh, fuel fertilizer and then of course, you know, fending off their pests with poisons. Yeah, so, so I like the terms logos and mythos. I got that from uh, Robert Persig, author of Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, um, because it helps us to understand really where we're at, is that at one point in time, the pre-scientific era, we had the mythos, which dominated, and it was the language we all understood. A lot of it was intuitive, sort of right hemisphere type stuff. Um, and then, now, of course, we came into the Enlightenment and science being the standard for what we think is real. And now we're coming to this point of convergence again. We're starting to understand why pomegranate was considered this immortal, you know, food of fertility, etc. Because now we see it actually does, but it doesn't distract from the beauty of the fact it is an ovary of a plant. It heals the ovary, or the walnut heals the brain. I mean, you can't unexplain. You can't unexplain that. You have to have some awe and appreciation for what's really going on. You know, it's the limits of our knowledge so we can experience truth in a way that is so compelling and poetic and moves us. It's happening, and the science is leading us there. Even though we shouldn't have to cut open any more animals. Okay, so I already went over this, but that's actually the study where they're showing the estrogen content and how it completely undid the ovarectomy-related, you know, menopause in the female rats. And I have actually indexed a whole section on overectomy induced changes, and this includes things like uh, plums and grapes. It's really, really fruits, actually seeds, flaxseed. I mean, these are all kind of fruits, actually, technically. But so, what, what, so in other words, food <laughs> is going to be how you maintain health late into year, in your years, especially women who have to deal with the fact that the ovarian reserve craps out around 40. Um, the ways that you can maintain, obviously, uh, the longevity by using our plant allies as intended. So, that's why this is so important. This is why I do this all the time. I drink juice. This is from Joyful Juicing up in Benita. They just opened. They do cold pressing. Love it. So when I drink this stuff, and it's expensive, it's like $11 a bottle, I understand what it's doing to me. I mean, it's just saturating my entire body with the blueprint for health that's not gonna come from any vitamin bottle. So certainly not most of the food that we eat on a daily basis. You know, I look at this as a way to center myself and protect myself from, you know, obviously what's going on out there. So remember, uh, food is not just matter, you know, building blocks, um, a source of energy, calorie content, but it's information. We have to protect that and be stewards of that information, which is why we're so against all the different 
yeah. factory farmed GMO type of processing of our food. Um, and hopefully, ultimately, food is what makes medicine unnecessary. So I'd like to get beyond food as medicine, sort of that whole concept, and just go back to the fact that we should hopefully never need it if we're out. And maybe we'll actually start growing it, get our hands dirty in the soil, so we can also support our underlying microbial reality. You know, we're 99% bacteria, and then we are viruses and fungi as well. It's a, it's a miracle that we hold together the way we do. Um, so hopefully that was helpful. Uh, we have a few minutes, I guess, for questions, if anyone has a question. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, it's hard to say. I would say, I will almost find fruits. Oh, in terms of detoxification, the difference between. Be oh. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, so is one more a detoxifier, maybe a nourishing first fruits and vegetables? I mean, looking at research, it's hard to say. I would say that they're both absolutely indispensable for both functions. You know, I think that in many ways, the raw food min movement has it right, when it comes to fruits at least. I mean, you can look at certain things like cruciferous, cruciferous vegetables and they're kind of weaponized with anti-nutrients. Oh, oh yeah, sure. And, um, but they also, see, see, here's the thing. I've been wanting to write about this for years on soy, okay? Everyone loves to just beat up soy. And I'm saying like the research, which most of the studies that I've indexed, and there's hundreds of them now on my site, we're done on probably GMO soy. Regardless, it is almost like a miracle healing substance. It's a medicine, not so much a food, like I wouldn't drink soy milk all day long and eat tofu blocks, but one of the compounds that everyone hates on is pro uh, protease inhibitors, which is why it may cause some hypertrophy or growth of the pancreas and the animal model. It may look like a tumor, but that's a whole category of sort of natural oncology medications because tumors secrete a lot of protease. So, Everything has balance and value. Um, so anyway, I don't know what I was trying to say, but vegetables are so essential for healing, um, and certainly fruits. I, my feeling is if you don't eat those daily, and like hopefully organic, then you're probably going to be in big trouble. It's like essential to regulate, again, our genetic and epigenetic infrastructure and superstructure. And so that's how I look at these foods now. Is, um, so, yeah, and they do so much, it's so hard to classify, you know, obviously what, what, what uh, they do differently. But get, get the grains out if you can. That's, that's like one standard rule for health I would suggest you, you look into. Okay, I have two questions. Um, the first one is on curcumin. Is it better to take, if you want the health benefits, benefits of curcumin, mm. is it better yeah. to take uh, turmeric mm. pills or... Yeah. Curcumin pills. It's such a common question. It's a good one. Thank you. Um, it's a really good one. Like, should you do curcumin, which most of the research is on this one phyto compound in turmeric, which literally has over a thousand in orchestration. And so, of course, many want to get that form in high levels. If you're going to go target a brain tumor, you'd want to get a lessonized form that's been you know, sort of nana size, so it's real small, probably in combination with piperine, a black pepper extract, and it'll get through the blood-brain barrier into the brain. But if you're trying to heal, and there's a lot of clinical research on this, like colon polyps and even tumors, you want to take the whole turmeric because it doesn't get through the liver very well. There's a glucuronidation barrier, which is why they add lecithin when you try to get it through. So you don't want it to go through that way, so you just let it paint the interior of your alimentary canal this beautiful golden hue, and it starts to regress those growths. So it depends on the situation. And I believe in the, the rule that instead of taking these heroic doses after the fact, doing sort of nutraceutical medicine, you just want to do culinary doses. And that preventive approach, using the whole herb, is going to probably bring you way further than even science can reveal for us today. There's a new study, actually. Everyone focused on curcumin. AR tumorone is a compound that has been found to induce neural stem cell proliferation and differentiation into new healthy n neurons. So that's a compound that's actually not going to be found in the 95% standardized curcumin products. So I think as we move forward, we'll find 
The best way to do it is the whole plant or do a good high quality curcumin, again, less than the eyes, so it gets through the liver barrier, uh, but always have the blueprint beneath it, the whole herb. I think Dean Martin can speak to this, of course. Paul Schulich, founder of New Chapter, this was always his philosophy, just brilliant herbalist. Um, so yeah, I would say both, if possible. What dose of AR-tumorin? Uh, I'm not sure what they used in the study, but I, it's hard to say with dose. I would say, again, if you can incorporate it into your culinary practice, um, or even if you do a smoothie, and you put like a teaspoon of organic, hopefully wild-crafted turmeric into, it's just going to be a wonderful way to incorporate it. Um, yeah, so less is more. And they're finding this. Like high doses of rosemary, for remembrance, has recently in a clinical study found to have a cognitive impairing effect versus culinary doses having the proper um, you know, cog cognitive enhancing effect. So we're finding, again, less is more when it comes to traditional herbs in many cases. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, well, when you're dealing with things like nanoparticles even, and some of the information containing biomolecules in plants, they're so small in theory that it shouldn't be affected by the actual mechanic, like laceration or whatever you want to call it. It would be more of heat, I would think, would be the main factor. Um, I, I, I believe you're correct. I think even the Vitamix or concept makes sense of taking the whole plant, but there is heat generated and probably some trauma. Uh, but then, of course, the cold pressing movement is all about taking stainless steel plates, low temp, te uh, cool, and, and just pressing, squeezing it out so that you're really keeping a lot of it intact without pasteurization. Um, and then, of course, there's the concept of eating the whole plant, like really taking your time and eating a carrot. Wow, what a thing that could do for your body. Oh, uh, a fr fresh turmeric root. Yes. Uh, can you bite a mix that or? Take it as a yeah, or I've tried. I eat fresh ginger and turmeric, and it's not a pleasant experience. So yeah, I would say if you can get it down, it's awesome. It's actually not a bad idea to do that with anything you put in your body. That's the whole philosophy against taking things in pill form. At least taste it. If you're gonna, your body will tell you how bad it is or how good. Try tasting a pharmaceutical. They're so r bitter that it just melts your tissue. It's just it's evil chemical crap. <laughs> Well, how, how, is, how is the pow powder then? What, what's the mm. difference? Powder? It's just the water. Yeah, it's just uh, dried. Um, you don't know unless you know whether it was exposed to heat, but sometimes they sun dry it. Mm. Like in St. Lucia, I get turmeric from there occasionally. Uh, mm. So the powder is just dehydrated and then some of the fibers removed. But um, I think the powder makes a lot of sense. And when you think again about that goddess, golden goddess, and all that information, intelligence in the whole plant. To me, the spice is very compelling versus the pills. But I do take pills as well. Actually, it's more convenient, so I do that more often than not. Good. Sliced and fermented cultured vegetables is a good way to do it, yeah. Um, yeah, I think you probably would. Uh, not all of them, but um, certainly I think, yeah, that's probably one thing you might lose. Yeah, yeah. Did I hear you mention to avoid grains except for rice that you said earlier? Yeah, else? my claim Could you talk to about fame, the avoid grains. My claim to notoriety was we were writing this little essay called The Dark Side of Wheat, and it got into just how dark the real history of, of wheat's penetrance into Western culture uh, really would it involve, with like the Roman Empire being called the Wheat Empire and using the wheat economy to dominate the ancient world and, you know, basically giving people free bread to. You know, it's like giving people fluoride, and then the bread and circus model, politically, you entertain them to death with their devices and Netflix, and, and everyone's bloated and sick, and they're not going to rebel against you. So that's why we're the new Roman culture, you know, we're the same, and we, that's why wheat has been, sec, you know, secular and religious traditions alike been glorified, when in fact it's one of the most toxic things on the planet, and not just because of post-harvent desiccants like Roundup being used, but because of its intrinsic there's 23,000 different proteins identified in wheat. They're disulfide bonded, many of them, which are almost impossible for the human to break down. We actually elect from this background of trillions of bacteria, a number of them to degrade those for us, some of which, like clostrid clostridium, are very toxic to us, Klebsiella. So 
yeah, you can go on and on about wheat being bad, but generally the idea is because we've only been consuming it for a nanosecond in biological time, 10,000 years seems like forever, um, we should just eliminate them entirely or go for the pseudograins, which are consistent with the sort of the forager model that was you know, millions of years old, quinoa, buckwheat, amaranth could in theory incorporate. Otherwise, tuber vegetables are an excellent way to get that kind of carbohydrate in our bodies. And I think the paleo movement uh, errs on the side of not enough of that kind of carbohydrate. Yeah. I have a question about uh, turmeric. Yes. I was reading a natural news article recently where they were saying that you would take turmeric and if you add a little bit of pepper, it will help yeah. the, the yeah. absorption. What other um, spices, foods, where you take it in conjunction with something else where you can help with more of the benefits? It's tough to say. I mean, you know, this, the truth is these spices are powerful medicines, and not everyone is going to, you know, respond great to them. So although in talking them up, you still have to be careful. So it's going to depend on the person. Um, it's real art and science. Um, but when it comes to ginger, like, is a huge, I, I love it. I think, and actually, if you get a chance to listen to Dean's talk um, and talk to him, I mean, he's a master herbalist. He knows infinitely more about this topic than me. But I will say um, these are very powerful uh, substances, you know, like pepper. I mean, I just have so much respect for them. I mean, they were often, you know, worth their weight in gold and whole countries fell or rose to power based on their access to spices. I mean, there was a reason for that. You know, we know now these spices could save us from the plague. They can save us from Ebola. They can do, oh gosh, I hope the FDA mole isn't in here. I'll be in jail later. Um, but it's the truth, you know. Now we're realizing, thankfully the science says that, not say or G, uh, that it's powerful. And I think we have another seven minutes. Yes. Uh, back to the juicing versus blending question again. I've been um, told that when you're in a healing crisis, if you've got a major disease like stage three, four cancer, that yeah. you really want to do more juicing mm. instead of the blending because the mm. juicing has a nutrient concentration that's more beneficial and yeah. you're giving your body a rest from digestion. I would agree, generally speaking. Yeah, I'm a big fan of Gerson therapy and they use you know up to 15 glasses of vegetable juice daily to put things like, you know, a malignant um, melanoma into remission, like 50-something percent success rate. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's I think, a good idea that, that, that what you're saying is true, yeah. Anyone, oh, yes, ma'am, in the back? Oh, sorry. Yeah. However, carrots have so much sugar yeah, in them, pressure. and sugar feeds <coughs> cancer. So if you're trying to juice for, say, yeah. cancer, is it still a good idea to use carrots in your juicing? Fascinating question. It's so bio-individualized, and I have the great honor of being colleagues with Nicholas Gonzalez. And this question came up recently in a panel in New York that I was on. And he does use high levels of for specific cancer cases because it's effective. And my theory is that you know, they do this with, you know, actually trying to diagnose cancer. They'll bind a glucose analog with radioactive substance to get you know, a suck into the tumor. They can see it. Well, if sugar is also being sort of, it's co-present with beta carotene and some of the other compounds we don't yet know, the information part we talked about that might, you know, educate the cancer to chill out or go away or become something more differentiated and healthy. Who knows? So there's always exceptions. So generally, yes, fructose, for example, industrial GMO corn derived, one of the most toxic and oncogenic substances on the planet. There was a recent study that proved finally that it's not a byproduct of cancer that the metabolism uh, shifts towards taking in sugar, but that sugar can induce the you know, cancer phenotype. And so now we're seeing it very differently. Um, but that's different, you know, because again, fructose as an isolate purified is, is just mind-numbingly barbaric versus if you get even agave in its natural form. I did a review of the literature. I was shocked to find there was nothing evil ever printed about it because I was always a, a belief, and I still don't do agave. I think it's too sweet that it's just as bad as fruct you know, high fructose corn syrup. It's like 90% fructose by weight. But because of the molecular information, I think that's how we can explain the difference qualitatively. Is there any truth to too many cruciferous vegetables causing thyroid problems? Yeah, they have goitrogens, which unfortunately, there are chemical ones that are even in organic food, like perchlorate. But yeah, they have naturally um, occurring 
biomolecules that will block the thyroid's iodine receptor. But the way you get around that, it's like those in Asia that eat tofu, same thing, is that they'll always have high levels of things like seaweed. They'll get 100 times more iodine than us in theory. So it's always about balance. And um, yeah, and thyroid cancer is one of the most overdiagnosed on the planet. So if you have had a diagnosis or you're preparing to get one, just read the literature first because you will have your thyroid removed, even blasted with radioactive 131 iodine when it's a benign lesion based often on iodine deficiency. And it's very, it's just very scary what's happening globally when it comes to thyroid cancer. Um, what is your... Um, yeah, I would say in food form, yes. How, how do you feel about wheatgrass and how many times a week do you think <laughs> we should have a shot of it? It's remarkable because, you know, I'm an anti-wheat guy. In fact, in my essay, The Dark Side of Wheat, I look at 37 days after you sprout a wheat seed, it produces high concentrations of wheat germ agglutinin, the lectin that causes irritation and other adverse effects at the tip where it might get eaten by a predator and at the, the root. And so, however, that's what's been so enlightening for me with Greenman Info is the research on wheatgrass, for example, in the old dog model of cataracts, completely reversing lens opacity just through giving them wheatgrass powder, like literally reversing cataracts. So, so I have to give credit to the reality, which is that we, you know, we know some things, but we really don't know much of anything. Uh, and there's always an exception. Um, and so I don't like wheatgrass sometimes. And I used to be at a health food store where wheatgrass we serve people, and I would take it sometimes. So sometimes I want to throw up. Cats will eat, you know, grass too, too, you know, as an emetic to throw up. So I don't know. Not a, I, I'd say probably it has far more good than than bad. And certainly the gluten's removed. Well, that's a good thing. But there is still the problem with wheat lectin that's still found in the plant because the plant wants to live. It doesn't want the cows to eat all of the, you know, the, the plants. So, yes. Yeah, just two minutes, yes. Um, two questions. Uh, first of all, on rice, how do you feel about that? I, I think it was presented, rice. but I didn't really hear a clear answer yeah. on that. <clears throat> and second thing, what is your viewpoint on sprouting mm. and using that within cooked food for people who have digestion issues? Um, oh, wait, rice, did you say? Well, the first question yeah. was on rice. Oh, rice, if yeah. that's If that's one of the better grains that you could try yeah. to have. Yeah, well, there's a lot of discussion about this in the paleo community. A colleague of mine, uh, Dr. Kelly Brogan, uh, in educated me to the fact that um, it, it, will buy, it will be digested like white rice cold into uh, butyrate, uh, fatty acid in the gut. Uh, so, and also, I know with the whole arsenic issue, brown rice is a big liability because it's in the outside that it concentrates. And I've given my children, like, brown rice, think it's better. And sometimes, like, I actually had Bella, my six-year-old, throw up once, and I thought that was why. Uh, but, you know, the glycemic index and it's, like, insulin-releasing properties. I'd say moderation is definitely the key. Um, but, yeah, it is still within the class of grains, cereal grasses. So I would say, yeah, I mean, if you, if you apply the perfectionistic principle to eating, it's so biologically harmful on some level. And on the other hand, you know, we're threatened with death now based on what we are or not eating. So it's a very hard time to live. So have some compassion for yourself and, uh, and good luck out there. <laughs> That's all I can say. Okay, uh, sorry, just quick second question was about sprouts. One of the things I have an issue with uh, is my digestive system. So yes. what I do is, to, in order to get my veggies kind of more concentrated, I grow my own sprouts, and I put that with my mm, cooked food mm -hmm. and some rice to help bind everything. Yes. So oh, does yeah. that seem like a kind of a logical solution for somebody who has a compromised system? I think so. I do think sprouts, based on the research on wheatgrass, for example, still are weaponized to a degree. Um, they have lower phytate, and there's things that are removed, but I think you could, I just don't know. That's a really good question. I mean, the sprouts of broccoli have something like, what is it, 300 times more beneficial sulforaphane than mature broccoli, so there's something about sprouts that have so much power benefit. Um, yeah, I really, I don't know, I'm sorry. Oh, and then I think, uh, do one last question, then we'll end, I'm sorry if we're holding anyone up. Oh my God, my view on the fish, oh my life. Well, I would just say if you acknowledge the reality, the thousand pound gorilla in the room of Fukushima and Chernobyl before that, and just nuclear um, fallout from our reactors here in, my, in Miami, oh my Lord. 
the sea is so dangerous. I mean, just mercury alone, but now with all of the radioisotopes that have accumulated will continue into infinite time because the half-life of these elements are as long as the age of the Earth. Uh, it's pretty dismal. So I'm very careful about seafood. I wouldn't touch the tuna, you know, with a 100,000 foot pole. The fish go for 100,000 a piece, but I mean, people still don't realize what this means. Like, you don't eat tuna. The mercury alone will end up killing you. But then, probably better. Yeah, small fatty fish, that's your better chance. But that's where we all need to really fi find some good sources. Um, there are some kind of farm-raised organic that are actually in the ocean, which are more controlled environment. But, uh, you know, again. But thank you. I don't want to hold up the next speaker. I really appreciate you being here today. And if anyone needs to find me, greenmedinfo.com. Thanks.